Then, how have aspens changed since 1995, right? So we uh, established, in 1999, we established 113 aspen transects on the northern range randomly across the northern range, all these different aspen stands. And we measured a lot of stuff, but I'm only gonna, I don't have enough time to talk about all that stuff. I'm gonna just talk about browsing. Uh, and so for every year, I, I tore my meniscus in 2000, so I couldn't do it. But I've spent between four weeks and three months in Yellowstone Park on the northern range measuring aspen stands every year since 1999. So I have a massive data set about browsing pressure and other things in, in Yellowstone. Same kind of belt transects that I described earlier. Uh, they're all marked uh, with uh, GPS, you know, and we've got rebar on either end, and we run a tape out and we measure out meter on either side. There's a heavily browsed aspen stand right there. And so I was trying to measure a wolf effect, right? Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to see if introducing wolves into Yellowstone is going to have an effect on aspen. And here's one of my plots, but let me go to the next one. This is a pretty good plot right here today. So here I am taking four to six weeks of my summer every summer. And by the way, Dean Sermo over there is not sending me a paycheck in August. Uh, <coughs> oh, that, I might hold you to that. Uh, and you know, 1999 browse pressure about 95%. Uh, 2001, you know, I have no data there. About 90%, 100% in 2002. Every sucker in that thing got browsed that year in the transect. You know, I'm, I'm getting frustrated, you know. I mean, how much time am I going to spend measuring a system that's not changing? And, uh, <clears throat> but then look here, in about 19, in 2004, in this particular stand in our transect, about 95% of the got browsed off, right? And then the next year, it dropped to like 38%. And now look at the bottom right here. This is the, the sucker mean heights. And there, there's two categories. Browse suckers are just what you think they are. They're, we've looked at some pictures of that. An unbrowsed old sucker is a sucker that's at least two years old because they come down in the winter to browse. So a new sucker would be one that just grew that year, right? So this is a sucker that had the opportunity to be browsed the previous winter but was not browsed. And <clears throat> so you can see, you know, right when the browse pressure dropped off to nothing, you know, the, uh, uh, the sucker heights took off. And now I, I've got data, I don't have it on this graph, but average height in this transect w was about 60 centimeters in 1999, about like that. Now it's like 370 centimeters, three and a half meters, that's about 10, 12 feet. Uh, and we, I've got many stands that, that have exactly the same relationship. Uh, plot 82 is another example. You know, you can see that same kind of relationship right there where you drop off on that browsing pressure and the sucker heights have gone up, right? So you read about this kind of stuff in National Geographic. This is the stuff they don't talk about. That's not every plot on Northern Range. Uh, here's plot eight. That's what it looked like in 2001. That's what it looked like today. I have to hurry a little bit so I can finish. But you can see, you know, this plot is very different than the first two that we looked at. Browse pressure has stayed very high. Sucker heights have stayed very low. So the question, why? Why are some doing well, some not doing well, right? And uh, that's where the wolf part comes in. And I don't study wolves, unfortunately. Uh, uh, but fortunately for me, a very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Doug Smith, he's the head of the wolf project in Yellowstone. He's been there right since 1995. Uh, <clears throat> and here he's putting a collar on a wolf. And I went to Doug and I said, I have this huge vegetation data set. There is nothing else like it in Yellowstone. I said, but I need wolf data because uh, <clears throat> you, you know, we have to try to tease out what effect wolves are having, if any, right? And so, you know, I, I was going to talk a lot about what a GIS is, but it's, it's, a, it's a mapping system that has a spatial database associated with it. These are all my Aspen stands, 113 of them, where I have all these records of get, gathered over 15 years or so. And to that, I added Doug's wolf data, 
What this is, is these are elk kills. Elk kills by wolf collected by his army of 18 year, 22 year old college students every winter. <laughs> It takes a lot of college students to collect this much data, right? So every one of these data points has a record associated with it. I just got one up here. This, here is a, a wolf that was killed on December 4, 2007 in Upper Blacktail Creek. It was a male and an old adult, probable wolf. Caught, uh, why do they say that? Blood, wolves on kill, right? And they got that one by air. So the challenge is, Take the good aspen stands and the bad aspen stands and try to relate it to that. This is a behavioral thing. You know? One of the theories, one of the hypotheses is that uh, elk will change their foraging behavior in the, if, uh, in the presence of wolves. And so if you, to, get a, to wrap your head around this, um, well, it's hard to wrap your head around. But here's one way to do it mathematically, to model it. And this is the kind of thing that, this is why I need a math position <laughs> to help out. Uh, the, this blue area right here, this blue shaded area is called a um, uh, kernel estimator. And so to give you an idea what that is, is let's say just for example, there's a thousand points, a thousand elk kills right here. And what these kernel estimators do is, this is a 50%. So if you take half of those locations and you enclose them in the minimum area, that would be the 50% kernel. So if you think about that, what's really happening there, it's the places on the northern range that, will, uh, that elk are most likely to be killed. You know, half of the thousand points, the rest are all kind of spread out. And so our, the hypothesis that we're currently testing, you know, we're working on the big kahuna paper, you know, the wolves, the, putting it all together. You would think, all, if the behavioral hypothesis is uh, legitimate if it can be scientifically established using you know the tools of modeling and statistics and so forth uh, these aspen stands should be doing much better right because if elk are don't want to be killed they would stay perhaps out here they would change their foraging behavior and they would be out of these areas and so that's actually the hypothesis that we're testing is that th this set of stands is aspen stands is doing better than the ones like, that are outside of that, right? Uh, <clears throat> but there's a couple of other things that, that, that might be happening. A paper we just published, uh, January 2015, 2015 uh, in ecology. Just came out this month, I was very happy. And uh, <clears throat> so we looked at the elk distribution, right? They do an elk census every year. And uh, you can, this is the pre-wolf elk distribution on the northern age. Northern Range. This is the post wolf reintroduction on the Northern Range. So there's the density thing, there's the number of elk, and that has actually dropped quite a lot. Uh, but there's also, scientifically, it's like, um, is, it, is it a change in behavior? Is it, is it simply a change in numbers? Or is it a change in how these elk distribute themselves on the landscape? And those are kind of the three things we're trying to tease out which is the most important. And you can see, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the pre-wolf era, this was the heavy uh, elk density area. No wolves, bears are sleeping, no predation whatsoever in the winter. Uh, this used to be, uh, arguably, you could still make the argument, used to be the best spot to hunt elk in the country, right here. And the state of Montana was making a fortune selling elk tags, <laughs> I'll tell you. <ya. laughs> uh, <coughs> And now, uh, in the, in the post-wolf era, you know, the, the dent, the dent, a lot more of the herd moves out of the park. So there has, there's less numbers, but they, they go out of the park a lot more. And it, the, uh, one thing I want to make an important point here. You read the popular accounts, and it's like the magic wolf. You know, the wolf changed everything. And the wolf definitely has changed this system. Uh, <clears throat> But it's not in isolation. A lot of other things happen at the same time. It's all about management. Starting, you know, you might have been looking at that. About 2005, uh, I started to see these aspen stands take off. And that was about the same time that the state of Montana started dropping the number of elk permits that they put out to hunters pretty dramatically because the herd size was going way down. And so, uh, so what you really are seeing, and we've got the, 
I've got the paper if you want to read it over there, you can pick up a copy on your way out the door, is an evening out of the risk of predation overall. Wolves inside the park, human hunting outside the park, but it, it's kind of evened out where it used to be lots of predation out here, you know, human hunting, none here. And if you're a hunter, you know, first day if you don't get your deer, you know they go hide, right? <laughs> And uh, these kind of plots are up in the park in the eastern part. Those kind of plots are down in the western part near Mammoth. And I'm not actually measuring stands anymore out in the Gallatin. But there is a, a relationship between the type of plots and their spatial place on the landscape. So to end here, uh, again, going back to Aldo Leopold and uh, you know, some of the hidden animals, maybe you've seen some of them, maybe you haven't in there. You can take a closer look later. But, you know, it's, uh, the wolf has definitely changed the system in Yellowstone Park. And, and, and you know, there's been human responses to, the, to that also. And, uh, you know, so that's the science part. But uh, Susan talked earlier, and I just want to kind of end with this. To me, Actually, I think it's actually a story of, of restoration and making the world whole again as much as it is a story of science, you know, because getting the wolf reintroduced back in the Yellowstone Park was a heavy lift. It was a really heavy lift. I mean, Aldo Leopold called for it in 1944. And it wasn't until 1995, it was 50 years later, that, the, that it finally came to pass. And <clears throat> You know, speaking for myself and maybe for others in this room, I think it's kind of a message of, of, of hope and, and the, uh, that, you know, it's, it's hard to make these changes, you know, but uh, I, we've made the Yellowstone Park uh, a little bit more whole and a little bit more complete. And so, you know, maybe that's actually the hidden meaning of the howl of the wolf. So. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, we will take some questions here. I do have uh, some articles up here that if you would like, I got three different articles. Two were, uh, have been published within the last year. You're welcome to take those. And if you like Colleen McCarty's art, uh, I've got a few of her brochures up here. You can take one of her brochures. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> First question. What's, what was your question? I think about 10 minutes of questions. I want, I want to see this. All right, I'll point out some of the animals. Okay, we, we got one right here. What do we got right here? Bison. Bison, there's a bison. Can anybody tell me where one is? The, the nose of the wolf is an owl. That's an owl. Yeah. The nose of the elk is what? The nose of the elk, yeah, look at that one right there. That's an otter. <laughs> There's a beaver right there. Oh, and the bear up at the left. There's a bear. There's this a bear. That's a grizzly. That's a grizzly bear. What's 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 jumping into his mouth? Oh, Cut, cutthroat yeah. trout. There are big feeders of cutthroat. There, there's another one in there that's kind of tough. Black bear. There's another one in there that's very tough. Here's one right here. Is it a bear? Northern Range. Think UW. Bucky Badger. <laughs> Raven. Doug Smith told me that he actually has his, his observers count how long between the time the wolf pulled down an elk when the first raven shows up at the kill. The all time record is like four minutes. <laughs> and there's a lot of animals, they watch the ravens. And they go where the raven, if they see a bunch of ravens coming down, they go there. So, oh yeah, we got the mountain lion up here too. We got the mountain, you see the ears there? Oh yeah, yeah. A little bit, that one's a little more abstract, but. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, going past the hidden animals. Uh, questions? Yes. Uh, I'm actually not a history on the uh, Native American history of the area. I mean, they were expelled. They weren't allowed to live in the park once the park boundary was established. 
I would say there's, the Shoshone have a reservation down south of there, the Wind River Reservation it's called. It's, uh, and I would imagine that, um, I think the Shoshone were the ones that were, the sheep eaters are kind of a part of the Shoshone tribe. I think they were mostly put onto the Wind River, River Reservation, which is south of the Tetons, basically. Yeah. How many of the wolves that were first reintroduced into Yellowstone actually survived? Just number 10? Well, actually, number 10 was, sh was shot, famously, uh, outside the park uh, within months of, of, uh, of being released. Um, enough to perpetuate the per... They were all, all gotten rid of. That's why I was kind of surprised to... Oh, no, no, no. They, they, um, they have some of them radio collared. They know where the dens are. Um, and, you know, the, the originally released... And there was actually two releases. Um, and so they denned and had pups. And, uh, you know, some of them... I mean, enough of them survived. Some of them were killed by cars, and you know, some of them were poached illegally, and some of them died in trying to take a bison down. You know, I mean, there's a variety, wide variety of causes of death. But there's a, then the population's gone up and down. It really climbed for a while, and then mange got in there and killed a lot of wolves for a while. Uh, but they have a, a stable population, I guess is what I would say. I, a hundred maybe in the park right now. It would be, that's maybe a ballpark guess. I, I don't follow the numbers totally, but. So the elk that stayed in the park, you showed them migrating north to avoid predation, but when they stay in that area, do they have to go to altitude to avoid the wolves? No, in, in the winter time, actually, one of the reasons they come down is because they're much more likely to be killed by wolves in snow than they are uh, if they can get below the snow line. So there's a couple of reasons why they come down. First, there's the, uh, a less harsh climate and more forage is available, uh, lower elevations. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, a healthy elk at least can uh, outrun a wolf pretty readily on just in the sagebrush, but you get on snow and that changes the equation quite a bit. So, so uh, but it's, it, the main reason they come down is, is for forage. Uh, that's the main reason they come down low. Would the same thing that you discovered in Yellowstone hold in other national parks? Uh, yeah, there have been um, other people who have done similar type work. Uh, I know in Zion there's been some work done there and in a variety of the western parks. And it, you know, if you go through the scientific literature, actually some of it might be in, cited in a couple of these. Uh, Yellowstone is sort of the ground central for this because the wolf reintroduction was such a seminal event in the history of the park. Were there wolf releases in, for example, Rocky Mountain? Oh, you're talking about wolf releases. I thought you were talking about trophic cascades type studies. Uh, no. Uh, they released in Yellowstone, they released in Idaho. There was a red wolf release down in New Mexico, which is a different species of wolf. Um, and they have slowly, I guess, expanded their ranges. There's wolves in Oregon and Washington now. And there's a few that have dispersed. There, actually, if you were watching the news, uh, Grand Canyon, there was a wolf down in Grand Canyon, and they got some scat. Uh, confirmed sighting. And they did the genetics off of the scat. That's what biologists do. They like to collect poop. Uh, <laughs> and they, they, the genetics are from Idaho. So it's, it went from Idaho to, they think, well, they don't know where exactly where it came from, but it, it, the genetics are the Idaho wolf.